over the years. I think meat quality is, is um, gathering a lot more attention these days. Um, used to, I think nobody cared a whole lot, <laughs> but there's a lot more attention to it. Welcome to the Poultry Podcast Show. Um, today I have Dr. Casey Owens here with me. She is the Novus International Professor of Poultry Science at the University of Arkansas. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me, Dr. Bobek. I really um, look forward to our conversation today. I do too. So my first question for you is how did you get into poultry? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I always like to share that answer. I was, uh, you know, I kind of grew up around the Dallas area, um, just north of there. And, and I was in ag. I had horses all my life. But then I got into ag and then um, did their poultry judging contest. Now they're called CDEs. Um, and so I, I did that for three years in, in high school and then decided to go to Texas A&M to study uh, my undergraduate days and I was on the poultry judging team there but um, I would say really the poultry judging in high school kind of led me into the poultry science department at A&M um, and then I just continued on with my education um, thinking I just like science and and enjoyed and wanted jobs that that would be a little bit more technical or or whatnot and so um, fortunately, I love poultry science and I like the products end of it. And so that's what I studied in my graduate years. And then I've been here at the University of Arkansas for, well, since I finished my PhD in, in 99. So, um, and I love it. I'm in a poultry science department here. So still, still love poultry. <laughs> still. Oh, that's awesome. So, so how has, I guess, over the past since you've joined as a, a faculty member, what's what's been changing in the industry and what have you been doing as far as research goes? I know it's probably quite different than when you started. Yeah, so my whole research program kind of revolves around meat quality. And so I've looked at um, production factors that affect quality. I've looked at processing factors, like for example, debone time or um, post-processing factors like marination ingredients, what things can do to product quality, but all of those factors and how they impact meat quality is my overall program. And so when I started here, you know, we were kind of still working on the whole pale, soft and exudative type meat um, and poultry, which is what I uh, had done with my, um, my PhD work. And so we continued that and then um, just continued to work on tenderness and work on developing some new methodology to assess tenderness that would help the industry um, collaborate with some really great people along the way. Um, and then the biggest change, I think, with the industry, um, well, not the biggest, but a big change um, in the last decade and a half or two um, has really been the shift of, of going from a, a I don't want to say small, it's small and relative now, but the shift towards larger birds. Um, and we really produce a, a large birds um, these days and the, the, the amount um, of birds that we do. And so um, with that, that shift in itself can, can change um, the quality of the bird. And so we've looked at small bird programs, big bird programs kind of along in my career too, to see how that impacts quality. And, um, and then most recently in the last decade or so, um, I've studied um, more of the, the meat quality def defects like woody breast and white striping um, and things of that nature, which some of that's come along because we have shifted to that big bird. Um, but um, that, that's kind of, you know, what how I've seen things change over the years. I think meat quality is, is um, gathering a lot more attention these days. Um, used to, I think nobody cared a whole lot, <laughs> but there's a lot more attention to it. Um, um, from around. I mean, I've always cared. There are people that care. Consumers cared, obviously, but um, there's more funding for it and, and so forth in more recent years. Um, so I, I have a, a very interesting question and you may or may not be able to answer it. It just kind of popped into my head when you were talking about tenderness. So is is tenderness, is that, is there something that can be done during live production that affects that? Or is, is the consumer, do they just not know how to cook chicken? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. So 
I always now have to um, kind of preface or my statement by saying, um, if we don't have woody breasts in the picture, because woody breasts can really com complicate texture. We, we can get into that later if you want. But um, tenderness itself, I mean, the, they're really the biggest impact um, or impacting factor on tenderness is the time at which you debone the carcass. Um, and so um, it's not necessarily, there's a little bit of impact from age, obviously, but um, that debone time can really impact the tenderness and it can mask other effects if it's more severe. So um, that's one big change that's also occurred in the industry in the last 30 years, 40 years, is that um, we've shifted to shortened deboning times shortened aging periods in the plant. So say, for example, in the 90s um, and before that, we were deboning carcasses. Um, you know, we process and then debone the next shift. So it could be four to six, four to eight hours um, before those carcasses were deboned, the breast meat was deboned. And so obviously there was also an increase in the demand for boneless breast meat during that period of time um, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and so forth. Um, and so in the last 20 some odd years, really two to three hours of aging is very common, but that's also a time period at which um, the tenderness can be affected the most. Um, so that that's why I've spent a lot of time on that area. So we've felt, you know, we've looked at marination techniques to help improve it. As far as consumers goes, yes, Chicken can easily be overcooked, <laughs> um, and uh, but you know that's part of the reason that we do marination in poultry is to help kind of pre prevent the the negative attributes that are associated with overcooking or early deboning. <laughs> yeah. So is the early deboning is it interrupting some process of rigor mortis or some other sort of like change from muscle to meat? Yeah, so the rigor period takes four to six hours um, in chicken. So we always say really prior to four hours, four hours is kind of in the kind of gray area, but prior to four hours, there's still a lot of energy left in the muscle um, that can react to external stimuli. So the cutting process of removing that um, fillet off the frame can cause the muscle to shorten. Um, and you may not see that necessarily with your eyes, but um, it can cause some, you know, little bit of contraction um, that can result in tougher meat because you're biting through a denser type of product. Yeah, that's that's so interesting how that has changed. I'm sure part of it is not a decision. Um, it's a decision based on volume or the need to move birds right through the process. Yeah, so the industry overall, again, um, we're talking 30 some odd years ago that, that that we did have those, you know, process one shift, debone the next shift, but our demand for chicken is so much greater. I mean, it's more than double. Um, I always like to look at those stats when I present to my students. I always give them a reference from like 1990s, early 1990s, and we've really doubled the production um, since then. But um the um, the we have to the industry's had to streamline the processes to get more throughput. Um, it's just very difficult to age a carcass eight hours or twenty four hours, and you lose yield the more that you wait as well. But just taking the 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 chickens like a whole chicken and storing it in a refrigerator or cooler um, for until the next shift is, is time consuming and, and labor intensive and, and so forth. So if we can kind of keep things streamlined, then um, that can help just the overall throughput and process efficiency. So marination is one way to help counteract that electrical stimulation, post-mortem electrical st stimulation is something that was studied really in the late eighties um, and really where I kind of did some of my master's work um, with my major advisor, Alan Samti, had done a lot of work in electrical simulation, but that's really more widely accepted these days. And that helps speed up rigor so that there's not as much energy when they do um, debun that, that meat off the frame. Huh, that's really interesting. So I know that 
there are some companies that do um, like a cool water ice bath after the harvest process. And then there are some that are doing air chilling. Is one of those uh, better for tenderness? So there's air chilling and water chilling uh, or immersion chilling. Um, immersion chilling is most common here in the U.S. There are a few uh, plants that air chill. Air chilling takes a little bit longer. Um, but you, so if you're comparing the process alone to the immersion chilling process, you may not see differences. You kind of have to look at the overall system. So if you were able to chill faster with the water chilling and you're like, okay, I'm, I've chilled, I've met four degrees Celsius, for example, at X time, it takes another 30 or 45 minutes, an hour. And I'm just kind of throwing out some numbers right now um, to get to that same temperature with air chilling. But in a systems approach, I'm going to compare when we complete that chilling process. So if we have to wait um, for the air chill birds a little bit longer, then they may not be as tough when you debone them, for example. There are some processors when air chilling first came um, in the in around in the US, there were some processors that actually had longer aging periods and they were still marketing air chilled carcasses or air, air chilled product and they marketed it as more tender and so forth, but it may not necessarily be from the chilling per se, but the other things that they may be doing. So if they have a longer aging period than those that may be doing um, immersion chilling, then there can be an impact. So it's a little bit more complicated than just saying air chilling is better than water chilling or vice versa, you know, cause there's, there's, there's things you have to outweigh, like it takes longer, that might be less throughput and, and so forth. So, yeah, that's a really interesting way to think about it. And yeah. Um, so, so with um, like marinating processes, do all chickens get some sort of marinade? And, and I'm assuming you're maybe just talking about like a salt solution or something, or is this like an actual, further processed product where, you know, it's like a certain cut that's got, in my mind, I think about spices and marinade, but I think I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the right definition. Right. For sure. So when the industry really is talking about marination, um, there are multiple types, like what you're, what you're saying from a consumer standpoint, they think about the flavors, obviously, like the spices and the lemon pepper and the, you know, whatever things, blends that they could put in. Um, when, when that's fine, that's going to deliver flavor and so forth. Um, when we talk about it kind of in our, our terminology, our jargon and, and what the industry is doing, they're marinating um, product. Um, it's usually boneless breast meat is what's marinated the most. Um, that's what's going to be impacted by toughness the most. And it's also the one that can dry out the, the most because of white fibers, but and less fat. That's really um, marinating with a, a low salt concentration. Um, and it may be targeting of like maybe 0.75% salt in the end for a final product. That's kind of what we use as a standard when we're doing studies. Um, and it may or may not have a sodium phosphate in it. It just depends on what the product is and what the consumer wants. So there are a lot of consumers that want clean labels and things that they can understand. Um, and so in that case, you may just have salt, water, and maybe some chicken broth in there that would add a little bit of flavor. Um, but this, the salt solution is going to really help with the, the increase of water holding capacity um, and improvement in tenderness of a product. But um, those products are, are kind of generally referred to as uh, enhanced products, like in the retail case. Now, you can still get more of what you, your classic marination, what consumers think, um, with the different flavor blends, um, but you would typically see those spices, seasonings on there. So hopefully that answered your question. That's a, that was a great answer. Um, in, your, in your work, just, uh, have you ever had the chance to develop um, one, like a seasoning blend or anything? Like what's your, what's your favorite flavor combination if you get to put some tasty spices in. <laughs> yeah, so we do a lot of workshops and just dealing with students um, where we 
we kind of play around with play around with um, rubs and we have a rotisserie um, cooker at our plants. And so that's always a fun product to make. Um, so there's all sorts of different types. I've worked with ingredient companies. I always said, like, hey, can you send me some samples? I'm probably not the best to blend them myself, but um, that's just because I'm not, maybe not as creative. But um, but some of the ones I really like are some of uh, like an Asian blend, um, kind of have this Asian theme to them or the sweeter. I kind of like the sweeter rubs, but I really like all of them except for spicy. I'm not a spicy person. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, if it's got any spice, I'm like, uh, it's too much for me. And, and people laugh at me, but that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll like uh, the other things. I like savory also, but um, I like the barbecue, the honey barbecue. And, and Oh, and, yeah, that sounds so, great. Um, but yeah, rotisserie chicken, always fun to do that with. And um, like wings, um, always fun to do um, kind of a, a dry rub and, and put them on a the grill or rotisserie oven or in the instapot in, in the, whatever they're oh, called yeah. the, the air fryers <laughs> they're really good yeah that sounds awesome um i was kind of interested to hear hear more about um your story with working with uh woody breast and white striping because i feel like you've been overly humble about your work in this area because I, I would consider you like world expert on in, in this so I'd really love to hear more because that is such an interesting thing that you've been working with for a very long time. <laughs> it, it, it's like when you look at the, like they say, the days are long, but the years are, are fast. But um, I feel like it was just yesterday that we were starting at uh, working in that area, but it was back in 2009. So it's <laughs> quite a while from, from now. Um, but yeah, there was, um, you know, it was something that was brought to our attention that there were, um, there were some boilers experience, experiencing this white striping um, and not a lot of re research, really none that I was aware of at the time had been done. And so 2008, 2009, we started working in that area um, to really characterize what it was and look at just some of the factors that impacted um, white striping. And um, there was just maybe a, a couple researchers um, working in that area, we we put out um, several different um, papers along along the lines um, with that, and and that was really the one of the first what well I'll call it a mopsy, but a defect um, that has some impact on quality, um, a lot on the visual quality, obviously, and it impacts the composition um, in terms of the eating quality. The, doesn't impact it greatly, except for water holding capacity, it can impact that. Um, but, you know, as we were going through about 2014, we really started looking into this woody breast. So um, I really credit um, uh, the papers out of, um, um, oh gosh, I forgot the country, but the Shivo papers, um, Polani that was involved in, in those papers that came out in 2014 or 15, um, they, they kind of, I had the one of the first scientific papers out there on woody breast, but prior to that, even Dr. Sarge Gilly had um, talked about woody breast. Um, but we really started looking at that in 2014, really early on. We were processing a trial, and we had um, a significant amount in in that um, trial, and so we started scoring um, from. From um, that point on, we've already uh, we, we were working with white striping anyway, and we started um, assessing woody breast. And then we looked at all the quality impacts on there, and and woody breast definitely has some um, impacts on quality with texture. So it kind of creates this really complex texture. At times, it's not really like just tough, but it's kind of got this flaky or sometimes referred to as crunchy in more severe cases because there's more collagen in the meat. And so um, it's not just like contractile toughness that we had dealt with, you know, the prior 20 plus years. And so um, we, we've worked on characterizing that, looked at factors um, that um, have played a role in the development of woody breasts and the same kind of factors that affect white striping. Um, and then Really, I guess, fortunately for our industry and our scientific community, there's been a lot of other 
um, researchers and the molecular fields and the, the you know the genetics and the and so forth that have really gotten into the um, the study of these defects um, because we see it across the board and across across the world. Um, and so we're still continuing um, in that area. We've looked at some detection methods. How how can we best score these um, and maybe more quickly? And we've looked at some um, live production impacts and how that impacts woody breast development. And I've collaborated with um, folks that are doing maybe gene expression and and whatnot. But um, I kind of consider myself now just kind of a um, I say cheerleader. <laughs> for the lack of a better word, but um, that do interface a lot with the industry. Um, and I, I hope, you know, I try to collaborate with those that are um, maybe don't have as many as interactions with the industry on those things, but, but definitely have better tools um, on the fundamental side that can study the, the issues. There's a lot of great work out there these days on that, in that area. So I, I, I understand some of the, you know, molecular qualities, but, you can have these you can have these defects individually or together, right? I mean they're they don't both have to be present, they can be independent, but you can also have both of them, right? Right. Right. We've done we've done a lot of work. Um I was gonna say that there was a, a paper that just came out of Canada from Dr. Barboot's lab and um and they uh, and we've we've have some similar data, but they've um have, has just published it this year, and it was on what you just said. Um, about half of the birds would have both white striping and woody breast. Um, so they don't always have to come together. They can be say, seen individually, um, but a lot of times they are seen together. Um, and some of the the things that I, I see is that we see white striping kind of early on and it can continue. It can be in a bad, um, well, in a more extreme case at, you know, at, at higher weights or whatnot, um, or you start seeing more woody breasts. And so what we don't really know is that, you know, does woody breasts really take over and, and um, kind of mask the effect of, of white striping at that point in time or, or what, but um, it is about half. Now, the other one that we haven't really talked about here is spaghetti meat, and that's kind of like a loss of integrity. And that one is observed, too, and it's a, probably about a third of the, the flay surveyed in that particular study had all three myopathies but, um, or those defects. Um, but those that the spaghetti breast meat is kind of interesting because we see that peak more at a, um, a smaller size bird, like that five to six pound bird, and then it starts to kind of subside a little bit. But there, but you know, Woody Breast is also taking off. So I don't know that anybody really knows the whole um, combination of all those things. If they're, if they're truly related, or if they're independent things, I think that they all have similarities um, from a histological standpoint. And so, um, but is it the same thing, or is it just um, a way to express itself, or or what? So does, um, I know just a little bit about spaghetti meat, but if, if it's kind of a loss of integrity and maybe the muscle fibers or the bundles um, don't adhere or stick to each other as well, does that, does that come out when you cook it? Um, or are those, are those tissues just condemned? Uh, you know, does it cause a big quality issue for the processing side? So for spaghetti breasts? So it's a, it's definitely a quality issue. And sometimes it's not, you don't see it until, well, you just don't see it. Um, unless, um, like plants will sometimes use these skinners on breast meat. And if they're doing that, sometimes they'll kind of nick the surface. If that surface is nicked, then you can see it a lot more prevalently, prevalent, more prevalently. I can't say that word now. You'll see it more, <laughs> more so. Um, but from a, when you're cooking it, um, it just kind of turns out kind of softer and mushier, if that's not a very good scientific term, but a softer texture. Um, and um, I don't think anybody's done sensory on it. It's kind of hard to repeat or induce. I've kind of felt, I've, I've had really no problem to induce woody breasts, but I have had more of a problem to induce um, spaghetti breasts on a more uh, routine basis to study it. And that's why we would have went 
want to induce it. But um, uh, anyway, it is a quality issue. It's not condemned. It's just a, a, a quality issue. So um, it kind of would have more of a softer texture to it. Um, could be loss of water holding capacity um, and whatnot. So are the, um, I know that there's technologies that some different uh, broiler companies have that it can automatically grade woody breast and kind of put it into different bins. Do you know kind of what is happening today with woody breast? I know it's becoming more of a consumer issue, but can those, can those breasts be ground up and used in something else or do they go to a completely different market? Sure. Sure. So, um, yeah, I guess in the early days of, of when woody breasts really started surfacing, um, there was a lot of um, condemnation and downgrades. I think that we've gotten past that and because and, you can have some place, it's really just a quality issue. And so um, they're either doing hand grading um, and it, it depends on the product mix of the particular plant and um, where that product's going or whatnot, or who their customers are. And, and so it's hard to say that everybody's ready because it really depends. But let's say that there it is an impact that, hey, woody breast is important to us and it's going to be a problem in our, our particular products. And so we're going to sort for them. So they could sort by hand. That's just labor intensive. Um, NIR has been used for sorting and there is one commercial application that I'm aware of um, that... Um, has had some success. Um, you know, I've been in a, a facility where they're using that, um, and I've looked at what's being kicked out, and it is typically the ones that are the higher degree of severity of woody breast. <clears throat> so that's good. Um, and then the next step is to find a home for it, right? And so we've even done some studies on like ground type of product of chicken patty. USDA and um, their ARS unit in Athens, Georgia, has done a study with it. And then um, uh, Dr. Hall at um, Purdue actually presented a, a webinar with PSA um, earlier this year to, to discuss what they do with that product. And they've used it in some ground product, some nuggets and, and things of that nature. And interestingly, what we found in our studies, and so, so did USDA, they um, found that the textural attributes are different. Water holding capacity is lower so that you are losing some yield when you put, say, 100% severe woody breast in a, a chicken patty, for example. You do lose more yield, and the texture is kind of a softer texture. Um, rather, if you have all normal, you have good water holding capacity, but that product might be more dense um, in a patty um, product. But what um, Dr. Hall had um presented um, in a webinar, which was kind of interesting information, is they, they use some sensory panels. So I don't think that, that, I'm not sure if that work was published or not, but in this webinar, he gave it publicly. And, um, the, they found that the consumers preferred some of the product with more severe pre rest. So that is encouraging because it can, it allows the industry to have a home for some of that product. So it's, it's just a quality issue. Um, so it changes the composition, you get a little bit more fat, you've got more connective tissue. The connective tissue is really changing the texture. And so when uh, you're putting it in a ground product, then you're not going to have the negative texture attributes like you would in a whole filet, which is the, the, the um, whole reason that we're doing that. And you also probably wouldn't make a patty with 100% woody breast, like severe woody breast. You would have a mixture. So it, it's a good um, place for it to go. And so, so I think that hopefully our plants are kind of learning that. But again, it all depends on product mix. If you're a, a processor that's um, producing fillets for a chicken sandwich and you don't have other product mixes, and, and I'm not as you know privy to all that information, but um, you may not have a place for it to go. And there's, there's you know, pros and cons of, of, of what, you know, what an individual plant has to go through, I guess. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, is so interesting. I'm, I'm glad that, I mean, from a safety standpoint, there's no issue, right? There is no issue with safety. It's just a kind of a product quality standpoint. <laughs> so that, that's really good. Um, I, I teach um, a poultry science 223, a sophomore level class, and 
each year I always have the students, we go, we go to Walmart or Hy-Vee and I get like six bags of chicken nuggets and I ask them to um, rank them what they think based on price. But um, I have, I, there's a variety in those nuggets, of course, and, and the branding and the marketing that, that goes on the front. Um, but honestly, you know, my favorites are the dinosaur shaped nuggets every time. Like, <laughs> and I'm, I'm so impressed from like a product, like a production standpoint that <laughs> I don't know what kind of little mini shapers or presses they have to make dinosaur nuggets, but they make me so happy. <laughs> right. right. My son loves them to this day. And, and I, your your I like your activity. That's so that sounds fun, because there can be differences in quality, um, uh, you know. And it's funny because I'll try. I'm like, oh, that's a that's that's a new, new nugget. I'm gonna try that one. Bring it home, and my son will be like, mm, this is not Dino Nuggets. <laughs> so he really likes the Dino <laughs> Nuggets. It's not necessarily. I mean, he's 11 now, so he's getting maybe over the shape. But um, the way he's used to how they bread it and and the texture. Yes breading on that and and that's you're going to have a variance across the board in different breaded products and what level of crispiness or what flavor you have or or whatnot and so that's what he likes um i know there was a product that came out not long ago that was um one to mimic chick-fil-a but in in the retail package so it had a lot of dill um, I, I could detect the deal flavor, but you know, Chick-fil-A, you know, start with pickle and, and whatnot. That's very popular. And so I bought those and think, oh, my kids are going to love these. No, they want the real deal Chick-fil-A. So <laughs> I like them. And, um, I actually know one of the, the gals that was in, involved in the de development of that product. But, um, anyway, I like them all. What should I say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the breading decisions are made, but the ones with really thick breading, it's just kind of like, I want the chicken, you know? So I, I don't know if there's a level of breading, but I kind of like the medium, the medium to thin, <laughs> whatever that would be. Well, you have to think about, um, you know, to, to from a label standpoint, to label it breading, it has to be under 30% breading. Okay, so if you oh, go over interesting. it's technically like a fritter. So in the grand scheme of things, I'm glad you brought that up because what is a breaded product? It's a substrate, which is the meat plus breading. Which one do you think costs more? The substrate. All right, the meat block. And so you've got a lot more breading on there. It's a way for a, a, someone to extend their product. So if you have less breading on there, you've got more meat. It's generally going to be a higher price product. But then back to what you say, you want more of the meat to eat. Um, and so when you look at your, your example that you gave to your class, if you go to maybe some generic brands versus um, one that's maybe trying to mimic Chick-fil-A, I don't know, just Dino Nuggets or, or whatever, you may see some of those type of differences um, where, oh, this one has a lot more breading than this other one um, and whatnot. So, and you've got to look, I, I wrote a book chapter on breaded products early in my career, I think my first year here. And so I went and got some products that were um, different, um, different prices. Um, and so the ones um, you have to look at the label too, because they'll say, you know, made with chicken breast meat or made with chicken meat uh, or chicken with rib meat or, or things of that. There's some label call outs. I don't have the specifics, so nobody shoot me here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you look at some of those things and you cut, you cut one of those, um, those chicken nuggets, you know, um, horizontally and look at the texture inside. You may see differences too attributed to what their, their products are. And it's not to say that one is going to be, Hey, we're, sh we're just going to produce a lower quality one. It's just, it kind of comes out of the cost, right? So more premium product may have diff different textural attributes than <clears throat> one that, um, has more of an extension, for example. Yeah. So I have, I have a very basic question. So I teach anatomy every year, um, just basic to the class. I always point out the chicken tender because that's probably one of my favorite parts of the chicken. Um, what, what are they considering when you say with rib meat? What are they considering rib meat? Because, I mean, the ribs are embedded. It's not like a, a pork rib where it's an actual slice of meat. So is it is it just the 
muscle touching the ribs from the breast? Like that has always intrigued me. What is rib meat from a chicken? Yeah, there's a little flap of, of meat that comes off <laughs> kind of on the side that comes with it. I think yeah. that's what you're referring to. So yeah. Yeah. I just always thought like that little piece of meat is so is so petite. Like it's it's interesting to me that they have to say with rib meat because it's not it's not you don't get a rack of ribs off a chicken. <laughs> If you really look at it, the fiber types might change in that particular area too. Um, but I mean, it's a good question. I should look into labeling more and, and and find that answer for you. But yeah, it's usually kind of a flap. And if it's real cleaned up, that just means that they've really trimmed it up. And like in the retail case, you know, you go over to um, we have Tyson product in our um, our retail case, and so I'll use them as as an example. They've got a product i think it's still called this when it first came out it was called this tyson trimmed and ready it's nicely trimmed up with usually the fat's been trimmed up it may be a portion product i don't know they've got different product names now um we do a high degree of portioning in the industry but um from a consumer standpoint like oh yeah that's nice i can just put it in the in the skillet or put it in the pan and and i don't have to trim it myself you know i don't like to have me as a consumer myself I don't like to have a lot of fat on the, the you know, on the, the side meat. Sometimes I'll, I'll get that big chunk of, of fat in there and take that out. Um, but so if it's already trimmed for the consumers, they're not going to have to go through and trim it and, and whatnot. And so. Um, I've been buying some more fresh chicken lately just because I don't always think ahead and it's already thawed so I can make whatever I want, you know, that night. And there are, there's some companies that do include the tender in that fresh breast and some that don't, which is really interesting to me because you would have, you would think that that would be, you know, a value, a value added product they would sell separately. Um, so I don't know if it has to do with the efficiency of trimming or what, but, um, I just thought that was interesting. That is interesting. I have, I'm not sure that I've seen that. I don't buy fresh chicken a lot. Um, that's not, you know, I love chicken. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen that particular cut. That's not to say it's not available, but you know, the one cut that I really like is turkey. Um, those turkey cutlets that they sometimes have in the market. Those are so delicious. Um, I like, yeah, I, I, love mean, chicken, but I usually buy chicken in other forms. Um, and I, it's really cause that's my primary thing that I eat when I'm eating out is chicken. But so to get my turkey and that's what I make it home and, um, and have a good time with that. So it's, Really, really nicely. I've uh, I've recently been obsessed with the turkey tenderloins. Those are amazing, and you don't they're you know they're in a very small hidden place usually in the case. So I wish they were more prominent because they're delightful. Yeah, those usually <laughs> are what you think about marinade. It's got a flavor or something in there. They um, I would think that they're probably competing a little bit with the pork tenderloin, the ones that are marinated and, and flavored. Um, but yeah, those turkey tenderloins are good too. Put those in the oven and or an air fryer and let those go for a little bit and have a really nice product. I, uh, I, I work pretty closely with our uh, Turkey Federation here in Iowa. And there's a couple of farmers that are kind of promoting the Turkey wing, which I am all about because there are so many more bites on a, tur a Turkey wing than a chicken wing. So if, if that could be like a product sold nationally, that would be exciting. <laughs> you know, start at the fairs. So they probably, probably do well at the fairs. I don't know. Oh yeah, we uh, the the Iowa State Fair has several vendors who do the turkey drumsticks, um, and so whenever I see one, I just think uh, there's I mean it's a big it's a big piece of meat, and I just kind of feel like we're all going back to the Renaissance age and just eating off of a <laughs> chunk of turkey. Kind of it's so funny. <laughs> They're not like a fork and a knife sort of product. It's just chew it right off the bone. Why not? <laughs> Is there anything else that we is there anything else that we haven't covered today that you uh, have a, a burning need to talk about? Because we've covered a lot of fun stuff, and the chicken nuggets is I love learning about that. So. Uh, no, no, I think just eat more chicken, eat more turkey. <laughs> That's my goal. Well, I did a chicken sandwich tour a few years ago. I'm always like I did this chicken sandwich tour with my with my students and um. And my whole goal was just to promote chicken. I'm like, okay, I'll go try out these these sandwiches. So I always like to do that when there's a new sandwich on the market. I'll try to go and, and get that and, and whatnot. But yeah, gotta promote our industry. It's good.
Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, there, there have been a lot of, from different fast food companies, they're kind of doing the specialty with chicken with different toppings, you know, plus or minus breading. And I uh, mean, I'm, I'm into cheese. So anytime they put different cheese on the top, I'm there. <laughs> right. Oh, it's a new sandwich, a different slice of cheese. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but the Chick-fil-A sauce, I mean, they have just perfected that for chicken. I mean, the flavors that go into that sauce are I, I could swim in it. <laughs> right. So good. Yeah, they have some good, good Chick-fil-A sauce for sure. One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Whoever developed that sauce, thank you from the world. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> That's awesome. Well, uh, to, to end our, our talk here today, I want to ask you the three questions that we ask everybody. Um, so my first question is, what is your favorite poultry related book or resource? Oh, my answer is probably gonna be disappointing to you. Um, let me see what I have here in my office. I did write or help edit a poultry processing book, so I'll just defer to that. Heck yeah, that, that's because, awesome. You know, this is the reason why, <laughs> because I use all the information in teaching, and I teach my undergraduates, and I teach some industry professionals, and so I pull information from that. Um, but there are some other. Um, I'll say processing related textbooks that are, are very good and are coming out. And um, Dr. Petrossi out of Italy is, has been an editor on one. I just wrote a chapter for that, but I'm excited to see that one come out because I think it will be really great reference material. But um, so that's my poultry book resource. I really thought I'd talk about quality. That, a lot. That's a great resource. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, what is your favorite book or resource outside of agriculture and poultry? So something not, not poultry related. Wow. Well, I was, I, I did a little retreat with some women in poultry, but, um, <laughs> um, it was, we read a book called dare to lead, I think. And so I'd say some leadership type books or, um, things about anything about work-life balance and 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 whatnot to to make sure you're getting self-care and and you're able to do and uh, well in your job and and get along with people and and things like that i don't know i'm raising two kids i really have a lot so i don't really have a lot of time to read either so (laughs) (laughs) i understand that that's a really good reference Um, what, in your opinion, what sets successful poultry professionals apart from those that are not? Then you probably heard this answer before, but my answer would be really people skills and getting to know people and appreciating, um, those, um, you work with and, and whatnot. So really developing those relationships. Um, is I think critical to success. Um, and then the other thing beyond the people skills is really those that are willing to take chances. You know, is it getting out of your comfort zone or um, taking a job across the nation or uh, changing a focus in your job? Um, I think that that, that kind of leads to success. Now, I'm probably not a great example of that. I've been here for 23 years. And so I'm kind of like, be set my ways. But I do try to branch out and do, um, you know, try to try to get new things um, in my wheelhouse each year. But um, anyway, yeah. So people skills and, and, and be willing to, to take a chance and, and get out of your comfort zone. Well. Uh- that I think that's a perfect answer. Um, I, I don't I don't think you're stuck. I think you're doing awesome things and you've definitely changed focus over the last twenty three years. So you're following your own advice without even knowing it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you for your time today. This has been really enjoyable and I, I hope all the listeners are as excited about chicken nuggets and Chick fil A sauce as we were. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>